ready, if you will, to jump back into normal society, which I don't think it's ever going to be the same normal again. It'll be the new normal. I think we all agree on that. But, you know, how do you handle that as a small business person? And, you know, thinking about the impact that you potentially can make as a small business person. So what I want to do in this first session is really um, talk from a place of inspiration as well as, you know, getting into some practical areas as well. Won't be able to cover it all in this first session, but um, just wanted to get started and help people to be thinking along these lines now. It's really easy when you're in the midst of a crisis to have your emotions just kind of take over and it can paralyze people. And then what happens is when the crisis passes and you have no choice but then to get really practical, you're not mentally and emotionally equipped for that as well as having prepared um, on a practical level. So I'm hoping um, some of the things that I am sharing today are going to be beneficial to all of you guys. So if it's okay with you, I'm just gonna plunge right in. And um, if you have any um, questions or anything as we go along, you can certainly just unmute yourself and, and just, you know, at that pause, just ask the question. Also, um, if you are familiar with Zoom, you know that there's a chat area. If you're not, if you look probably at the bottom of your screen, you'll see that and you can type in chat questions. And I'm gonna to try to look at those at the end after I've went through um, the slides that I've got. Sound good, everybody? Awesome, okay, let me share my screen here so that I can get that up. All right, can you guys see my slides here? Can you nod, do you see them? Okay, awesome, perfect, okay. All right, well, the first thing I thought would be interesting to share a little bit of a cartoon here with you, because I feel like people are falling into one of two categories. Um, they're either the, the person that's standing there going, come on, let's do something to fight this, or they're the, the Superman going, hey, you know, I'm doing it, I'm staying home, I'm doing my part. And I think it gets confusing sometimes for us as to, you know, like what is the right choice for us to make at this time? Um, but I also want to share some, these are real quotes from real business people that I've been talking to in the past few weeks. Um, you know, just concerns that they have, you know, just hoping that they can survive, their business can survive. Um, you know, dealing with the loss of control and, you know, how are they going to be able to fight to come back, you know, strong when it's over? And a big one is staffing. I know a lot of small business owners, I don't care if you have one employee or contractor, you know, when I say employees, just know that I'm also including subcontractors in there because a lot of us use subcontractors. But if you have people who are relying on you for some, you know, form of income, that weight of responsibility just lays on your shoulders. And I know some of you on here um, operate seasonal businesses. And so that can be especially daunting and challenging too, as far as, you know, am I going to be able to get people in here and get them trained up in time to be able to open my doors and hopefully salvage some semblance of my, my income this year? Um, you know, the other question a lot of people have, and I think rightfully so is, you know, when this phenomenon passes, what is going to be the protocols? What are going to be the social acceptances for human interaction? Um, you know, I was just watching something last night, I guess it was, that was talking about um, how, you know, we are a handshaking society in the U.S. And I don't know about you, but, you know, you think about, will I ever feel comfortable just automatically shaking someone's hand again? We don't know those things. Um, so those are going to be some of the thing, the little um, thoughts that are going to be playing in the back of people's heads when we do start to return. You know, in your business, if you operate the kind of business where it's very commonplace for people to be in close proximity to each other, what might that do for your ability to handle um, volume? Will you be able to have the same numbers of people coming in? If you do, are you going to have to put 
things in place in your business that causes a certain certain amount of distancing or separation? Those are all real questions that people are, are struggling with. And then of course, you know, how about how you're feeling inside? It's interesting to me how many have shared their concerns about their own emotions and, and they're trying so hard to um, not be negative and, and not have that parlay onto other people, but that really does concern them. And I think as time goes on, I think it gets more difficult uh, for people to restrain from some of that spilling out. And then just this morning, I was watching a program um, doing some research about PTSD because I've written about PTSD in the past for the common everyday person. You know, this is not PTSD for the military, but everyday people can have it. And I certainly believe that we are going to be a society that's going to have a lot of PTSD running rampant um, among us. There's going to be a lot of adrenal fatigue and, and adrenal fatigue is where your adrenaline has been running really high for a long period of time or chronically. And then after a while, your adrenal glands are exhausted and they really struggle to produce adrenaline after that. And that's when people can fall into um, like chemical imbalances and clinical depression and, um, you know, like ferocious anxiety can really take over for people because their bodies are not physically able to manufacture the chemicals that they need to be able to deal with things that they've been dealing with for a long time. I think that's going to be a deal uh, for a lot of people as we go forward in our society. So we're going to have to know that as business owners here and, and leaders, here's what you're going to have to remember. Every employee that you have, every vendor that you have, every customer that you have in some way is going to be dealing with a mental fallout from this pandemic that we've had. And I say that not because I want to like weigh you down or make you feel um, as if, you know, you're, you're just overwhelmed and, and what's the use? That's not my point. Actually, as you're going to see, we're going to talk about ways that you can go in to a problem solving mode when you realize that. So let's go, let me get this off of my screen here, maybe. Okay, um, I love this quote by Napoleon Hill. Every adversity, every failure, um, every heartache carries with it the seed of an equal or greater benefit. And I think that is so very true. You know, when I look back on the Great Depression, there were many people who were in extreme poverty, poverty, but there were people who absolutely figured out how to um, overcome and they did some, some innovative things. And so they were able to, you know, bring good out of that situation for themselves. So one of the things I want to encourage you to do is to focus on what you can control versus what you cannot control. Now, that might be kind of one of those like, well, duh, you know, statements. But here's the thing. What happens to us is we can know something, but we don't necessarily do something with what we know. And that's what I want to remind you of is remind, you know, catch yourself, really pay attention to your self-talk. What are you saying to you up here? Because whatever you're saying is going to be projected in your actions. And if you don't remind yourself of the areas that you cannot control, you will be spending a lot of time and energy trying to do something that's not going to make any difference. So focus on what you can make a difference in. And as much or more than a crisis creates new problems, a lot of people don't realize that a crisis actually more so reveals underlying problems that already exist. So in your business, actually, this is prime time for you to, you know, really sit down and think about your business and what are those problems that maybe were overlooked or maybe invisible to you that you can help identify at this time and start a resolution plan for those. You know, look at how you can, when you come back, when we started this recovery process, like you can say to yourself, I'm going to do this better 
than what I was doing it before. You know, organizational issues are like dross in silver or gold. You know, it's like, you know, they're impurities. And so a high degree of heat causes them to rise to the surface. Well, this crisis is our high degree of heat right now. But once problems rise to the surface, that's when we can skim them out and we can purify our processes and our performances and our profitability as a company. And a lot of people don't look at it that way. They don't realize that they get caught in the, oh, woe is me or everything's so horrible. But this is actually opportunity time for us to be able to pull that off. You know, after we get rid of the dross, you know, then a lot of that cloudiness that contaminates our professional and personal relationships is reduced and it helps us actually repair our people problems. You know, a lot of times we get so caught up in finger pointing at somebody else and they're the problem, but in reality, there are some things, some invisible drains going on. We're gonna talk about those in a, a couple of minutes that actually can hamper, they can hurt our relationships with people. And removing the dross provides clarity. It does allow us to see our other invisible drains. So let's talk about what invisible drains are. So invisible drains are those issues that steal time, energy, money, and other resources from your organization and from you. Although a lot of times you may not recognize them as the true source. You know, we'll point to a symptom and we'll think that that's the problem. So I'm gonna share with you seven core invisible drains that I have identified that I don't care what business I go into, I don't care what industry I go into, I know that every single time when I walk in the door, I am looking for these seven areas because I'm gonna find them. And it doesn't matter if you're a solopreneur, you're, you work you know, just for yourself and your own business, or it doesn't matter if you have a business that has 10,000 employees, I promise you these core invisible drains exist. So here's number one, unclear and inconsistent expectations. It is amazing. And I will tell you too, the, in the order that I have these listed, this is the order of importance. I feel like they need to be addressed. And again, this goes back through years of working through various industries and businesses. Um, I haven't seen it fail yet that there are not unclear and inconsistent expectations in an organization. But what we do is we go through our days and like we assume that people should be able to read our minds. They should know what we're thinking. They should know why we're thinking what we are, but that's not indeed fact. And if we're not clear and consistent in expressing our expectations to other people, then we're setting ourselves up to get frustrated and we may be setting ourselves up for failure with other people. The second one is unclear and inconsistent communication. You know, how are you communicating your expectations? Who are you communicating to? Oftentimes I'll see, um, let's say that someone decides that they want to, um, offer a new service or start a new project. What will happen many times is they'll maybe talk to one or two people or one or two groups, but they don't follow that communication chain all the way through. They don't talk to everyone who is affected or going to affect that process or that new service. And if you don't get some insight from those areas, I promise you, you're gonna run into issues. The third one is unclear and inconsistent processes. Have you really thought the process out before you just implement something or jump in with both feet? So often, you know, we're just like, oh, that sounds like a great idea, let's do it. You know, and I can tell you, I'm a let's do it gal. I am not one to sit on my laurels and, you know, just, I am not afraid to try new things at all, but I have learned the value of really thinking through the process. And again, getting that communication. And when I say communication, let me say this too. It's not just talking at people. It's listening to hear and learn from other people. Communication is speaking and listening. It's two-way, it's dialogue. If you are having a monologue, you are not communicating with someone. But 
to make sure that your processes are in place. You really need to make sure that you get input and insight from some of your people who are going to be dealing with things more directly maybe than you will be. Or people who are going to be affected by the consequences and the outcomes of those choices. And when you do that, what you'll find, I work from a preventables mode, okay? Preventables is, I, I ask myself all the time, so if I do this, what's the potential outcome? What are the potential issues that may come from that? What can I prevent now? Instead of waiting to let those things develop, I really try to have vision and look ahead and work from that preventable mode. So by thinking those processes through, that's one of the ways that, that I do that preventable action. Number four, we all know it, we're all guilty of it, unclear and inconsistent training. It is amazing how many times a leader will tell someone to do something and then it's almost like they have the mental like check off list like check oh did that okay i'm done i can walk away well here's what they don't realize when you verbally give instruction anytime we do anything verbally the listener hears an average of 25 percent of what we just said so guess what that means with the other 75 percent it is out the window so you want to make sure that you are training and training well. And training well does not mean that you go and you tell them, you give them instructions one time. A couple of things you can do. You know, make sure that whatever you're going to tell them, you have it backed up in supportive writing. There are some personalities that require something in writing for them to just have the comfort and confidence that they remember it properly. Um, for some people, their retention is not as good as others, and so that helps them. But for whatever the reason, if you just can take a few minutes and write it down, then when you verbally go over that, then they have something to reference back to. It will reduce mistakes, and it will save you money, and it will save you time down the road. I can't tell you how many times I have had people you know, a, a business leader contact me and they're so frustrated because they gave verbal instructions to employees and these employees took off and they thought they were doing the right thing. And they start building something or they start preparing something. And then not only is a lot of time lost, which we all know is money, but so are materials and supplies sometimes. So I really encourage you to consider the amount of time that you're willing to invest in training because training is an investment and it does pay off. The next one is unclear and inconsistent people care. And I used to have this as just unclear and inconsistent customer care because I will tell you, I've moved away from the term customer service. Um, the reason I've done that, customer service has become cliche. You know, people hear customer service all day long. They don't even pay attention to the term anymore. But customer care, it's a little fresher terminology, but it also has a little deeper meaning, I think. You know, customer care just, it, it has that essence to it that, you know, you really do care and you really are going to go that extra mile. But the reason I moved away from just customer is um, the more that I really thought about this, I realized that if you don't take care of your employees, your employees aren't going to care for your customers. So you need to make sure your employees are included in there. If you don't take care of your vendors, your vendors, your suppliers, you're maybe not going to have the resources to provide to your employees or to your customers. So you really need to think about people care. But the final piece to that is so many of the um, leaders that I work with across this country, I find often that if things, even if things are going really well at work and with the business, oftentimes their personal relationships are a train wreck. And I will tell you that whatever happens to you at home is going to affect work and whatever happens at work is going to affect home. If you don't have peace at home, you're going to carry that in to the workplace with you. You might think you mask it,
but you don't do that as well as you think you do. And this whole thing about leave your problems at the door before you walk in, look, we can all tell each other that all we want, but reality is if you've got issues, they're coming with you. They're like a cloud that you just wear over your head. So we really need to consider um, making sure that when we're thinking professional development, that automatically means personal as well too. We really want to care for our relationships. And then number six is unclear and inconsistent accountability. So often leaders restrain from holding people accountable. They either are uncomfortable because they're not sure how to hold them accountable. They refrain because they want to avoid conflict. Um, sometimes they just don't want to hurt someone else. But what they can do is that they let poor habits and poor behaviors go on for a very long time. That can drain like a sieve out of your organization. Because if you don't address those things early and often, then that becomes almost like its own virus. I mean, you know, we're all talking about viruses right now. Well, I will tell you that poor behaviors, attitudes, and habits are viral in the workplace. I call them staff infections, and they will pass like you cannot believe. If one employee sees another employee getting away with something, you know what they tell themselves? Well, either A, it must be okay because they are, or B, I'm justified because they are. And so what you can do by not stepping up and dealing with things in an accountable way, what you can do is actually help manifest more of that viral spread and not even know that you're doing it. So it's better to deal with it when you're calm, not waiting until you blow up. This is, this is what I see most leaders do. They just kind of like shove it down. And I always say human beings are like volcanoes. If you think of our um, emotions like magma, it's like we shove the emotions down, okay? But we can only go down as far as the last thing we shoved. And what happens over time, the pressure builds because it's rising higher and higher. And then that's when we have an explosion point and we just boom all over somebody else, right? But if you intentional to do healthy venting, then you can avoid the big explosions at the inopportune time on the wrong person. And how you help make sure that you do healthy venting is to make sure that you are intentional to deal with the right person at the right time. And that is early when you are calm and doing it often so that there's not an accumulating effect. And I will tell you, it really, really works with people. People, even if they don't like what you have to say, they will respect you when they recognize the truth coming from you. And especially if you, if you handle yourself in a dignified way, like you're not trying to strip them of their dignity, but you're just really um, saying these are the facts. This is what we need to deal with. I need your help. How do we get this solved together? But people understand when they're doing things out of line. And number seven of the core invisible drains is unclear and inconsistent execution follow through. So often people will say, oh, well, Anita, I know that. And then my response is this, then tell me what you're doing with what you know. Because oftentimes people know things, but they're not doing something with what they know. And if you are not proactive and positive in that, I can tell you that everything else is just going to fall apart. You've got to follow through. So those are my seven core invisible drains. So what do you do with those right now? I would really encourage you to talk with the people who, again, are affected by your business, your choices, or affecting, and really measure, get a barometer of where you are in these areas, and start working up a plan now to start plugging those drains. You've got you've got this time that you haven't had before that you didn't think you would have. So really start working on a plugging process. What are you going to do to plug your drains? One of those, and some of you um, 
in this group right now will uh, recognize this, appreciate this. We um, in the outfitting business oftentimes deal with floodwaters, okay? Weather affects everything. But I learned a long time ago that floodwaters recede on average at the same rate that they rise. I predict that we are going to say, see the same thing with this pandemic. I think it's going to follow a very similar pattern that the rate that it rose, we're going to see it peak and then it's going to come down at about a similar rate as well. And I think that if we look at it from that perspective, I think it can help us be more prepared for the recovery side of things. So what can you do? I love Albert Einstein, in the middle of every difficulty lies opportunity. There's a lot of opportunity for small businesses right now to be preparing. The first thing is, you know, I wanna remind you that we all influence someone, but the question is, are we influencing well? And I want you to think about that, not just for later, but even now, what are you doing to influence your community, your people? your customers that have been coming to you for years, um, your audiences that you've stood in front of, you know, whomever those people are, are you influencing well today? Are you someone who is offering um, a positive voice, some encouragement, some hope? If, if this world ever needed hope, it's right now. Well, what can you do and how can you do it in your own unique way? Because two of us can offer hope, but we'll do it from a different perspective because we're different people. I already mentioned this. One of the things you can do is listen to truly hear and learn. I absolutely believe we were created with two ears and one mouth for a reason. Most of us tend to forget that sometimes. But, you know, listen to learn. Listen to what people are saying. You know, I, I'm not someone who spends, like I don't spend hours on social media, but I'm on there. And when I do go on there, I really go with a voice to, um, I want to hear what people are, are saying. Because look, they will be very honest on social media. There's something about hiding behind a computer screen, even though you're putting it out for the whole world to see, that people will spew. But what I try to do is look at, even when they are making negative comments, to really listen to the heart behind that and figure out if there's something that I might be able to do to help. Here's another um, huge thing that many people forget. You know, be a promise keeper. People do business with people they trust. It's better not to make a promise than to make one and break it. And whether you use the word promise or not, if you tell someone that you're going to do something, you have made a promise. Others have a reasonable expectation that you should keep your word. You can't change what you did yesterday. You can't change what you did up to this moment, but you can transform from this moment on. You can transform from today on. So really listen to yourself. If you tell someone you're going to do something, make sure that you do it. If you are making any kind of claims or promises to people right now, when we move into recovery phase, make sure you follow through, make sure that you execute on that. And you know, that may seem like common sense, but I'll tell you, it's amazing how many times a day human beings tell people, oh, I'll call you back, or oh, I'll get you that information, or oh, I'll do this or that, and they don't follow through. We have really become a society of promise breakers. Um, I thought these were some interesting statistics. Sources report that small businesses and organizations make up 99.7% of U.S. commerce. 99.7% of our commerce is small businesses. So if you think that your small business isn't important, you just consider that fact. According to the U.S. Census Bureau, employer firms with less than 500 employees make up 46.8% of our national payroll. And the SBA's Office of Advocacy notes that 96.1% of new innovations, ingenuities, and patents originate in small businesses and organizations. Therefore, small businesses and organizations naturally develop and provide the highest percentage of leaders in the world. I absolutely believe that. But then I go back to what I said a few minutes ago. We all influence someone. Are you influencing well? 
if you want to be an effective leader in our new normal, you have to realize that not all leaders are effective, but you don't have to fall into that category. So I want to just talk a little bit about being an effective influencer because you were made for a, making a difference. And I really want to see more people do that. I want to see people rise up at this time. I want them to understand that they are placed in their position for such a time as this. Their businesses matter. The people that they're touching matter. The impact that they have a potential for matters. And I don't think enough are thinking along those lines right now. I think that people are making fear-based decisions or they're wallowing in fear and anxiety. Effective leaders intentionally focus on influencing well at work, at home, in their communities, in the wider world. In other words, effective leaders don't just think about self. They think about their impact with others. They face reality. They don't surround themselves with people who just tell them what their itching ears want to hear. And effective leaders keep their eyes on the strategy, the overall vision, but they don't miss the important tactical opportunities, those details that help make the division possible. And effective leaders evaluate their organizations and themselves regularly. I can tell you in my work as a business coach, a lot of businesses will evaluate, or a lot of, I'm sorry, leaders will evaluate the business, but they don't necessarily slow down enough to evaluate themselves. And I think that is a missing link. So one of the things that I use a lot is the SWOT analysis. Um, if you are familiar with a SWOT analysis, that's awesome. So that's strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. But have you ever done a SWOT analysis on yourself? Think about that for a minute. Most people have not. Again, they'll do it on their organization, but they've not done it on themselves as a leader. I think right now is a perfect opportunity for people to sit down and do this kind of analysis on themselves, as well as their business and organization. Because there's something about doing it in black and white that gives you a visual. It, it, and it almost, it, it's like things like come to the surface that you wouldn't have seen otherwise. And you can see some gifts and talents maybe that you didn't recognize were there, as well as maybe see opportunities for dealing with some of those preventables and plugging those invisible drains. But I really encourage you to take the time and do a SWOT analysis for both the organization and yourself. So let's talk about ingenuity and, and innovation. Um, this is one of my favorite things to share with people. I absolutely believe you cannot experience a miracle without first having a problem. And as I've been thinking about this pandemic, I realized a pandemic provides a hotbed of potential miracles, but you need to pay close attention to every concern, complaint, and cry. This is one of my secret weapons that I use. Think about what people are complaining about. What pet peeves you have. What are other people crying over? What are they arguing and debating about? You know, listen, start really listening to yourself, your family, and watching social media for those complaints, concerns, and cries. I promise you, when you start doing that, you will start having new insights about ways that you can help solve problems for people. And that's what small businesses do. Ultimately, above everything else, they solve problems problems for people. But what we do is we kind of blindly go through life or we close our ears because we're like, oh, I don't want to hear that negativity. But see that negativity, it's like a gold mine. And if you really pay close attention, then you can understand what people are looking for. And again, I mean, people will pay for solutions to problems. Ask yourself what problems you can solve for people now and later. You know, don't just think about this moment, but what is the potential? I mean, I know it's hard, but imagine what life might look like. Let's say if we're shut down for another 60 to 90 days. And then take that out further and imagine six months from now. What this nation might be dealing with. And then ask yourself, what ways can my business help 
to, you know, again, like revive the spirit of human beings? What are some practical things that you might be able to do to help your fellow man? Because I'm going to tell you, there's going to be a lot of needs in the coming months. There's going to be a lot of needs around mental health. I really believe mental health more than anything else. It's going to be an issue. You know, those of you who work um, in the outdoor industries, we all know how healing nature is, right? That is an area you should be focused on. And I would be working on your messaging now. Like, don't wait until later. Don't think, oh, well, you know, I've got six months. I can wait. Now is the time to put the messaging together. Now is the time if you can do some, maybe some video tutorials or um, maybe some, you know, video encouragements or inspirations or maybe, you know, a video that talks about the statistics, the science behind how nature is truly healing to the brain and the body and the spirit, because those things are real. And do it in a way that's unique for your business. Um, you know, I think about like, uh, like people who own, you know, hair salons. I mean, hey, hair salons are on my mind because my gray is really starting to show. <laughs> But, you know, I think about them, you know, what do they do for mental health? Well, you know, I know when I go in and I sit down and my stylist takes care of my hair and I walk out and I feel fresh and it, it makes me feel like I look better. It's good for my mental health. You know, those are some areas that they can be focusing on, but I don't care what kind of business you are. We all need to be thinking along the lines of mental health because it's going to be a commonality that we're all going to be dealing with. Another thing that I often encourage is spend some time online looking at negative reviews. A lot of times people avoid those, but again, I, it's a gold mine. What are people complaining about? Well, hello, those are problems that can be solved. And you can look not just at your reviews, but look at competitor reviews. Look at, you know, others in your industry, look at their reviews, look at different parts of the country. You would be surprised at what kind of innovations you might learn because of someone else's issue or an innovation that just comes to your mind that you wouldn't have thought of otherwise, but really look at those negative reviews. Something I, I challenge myself with very often is turn the problem upside down. You know, whatever the problem is, I just ask myself, well, what might the opposite of that problem look like? And by doing that, turning it upside down in my head, it really helps me come up with a lot of creative solutions. You know, now's a great time to work with your friends and your family from home and on video or conference calls and start brainstorming. You know, brainstorming is, is that time where you don't like throw anything out. No idea is too crazy. You don't say, well, that's not feasible. We can't afford it. You just put it all down for the moment. You can flesh it out later and decide about feasibility. You can decide later, you know, whether, you know, something uh, is cost effective for you or not. But by allowing yourself to freely brainstorm, what happens is one person's idea may trigger something in somebody else. And the first two ideas may be crazy, but a third person comes up with something that will really work. And the more free you are in doing that, the more those create creative ideas come. Um, another thing is, you know, as leaders, this is not the time for only I have the good ideas, itis. I mean, so many leaders, it's like, if it's their not idea, they're not listening to anybody else, don't make that mistake. You know, really, don't just um, listen to other people, but, you know, entertain their thoughts and ideas and also give them credit, by golly, don't take their idea and then suddenly start calling it your own. I see this happen so many times. You talk about a trust breaker, that will cause people to withhold. But, you know, you make it a we spirit. It's like, hey, this one's so-and-so's idea, and I just really want to, you know, applaud them, and I, you know, want to recognize them for that idea it was so great because they've made such a difference in the business. Now is a great time to start doing more of that with your people. You know, you may not be able to be on the front line in the trenches working in your business right now, but you can be working together behind the scenes. You can be like the engine beneath the hood right now. 
because those employee insights, those frontline people can really surprise you. And I will tell you, so can your family sometimes. Um, sometimes we don't want to ask other family members or friends or, or, you know, for whatever reason, but sometimes it's interesting what an outsider's view is, you know, those fresh eyes and ears are pretty incredible. And create a recovery preparedness plan now. You know, don't wait until the crisis hits, and it will, because you're going to have to be ready. Here's what I predict is going to happen with a lot of small businesses. It's going to feel like this lasted forever while we're in it, and then suddenly it's going to feel like it, it lifted. And when it does, everyone's going to be in a scramble. They're going to be a scramble of first trying to process these new emotions. Remember, from a place of adrenal fatigue, so you're not going to have the same strength of brain chemistry that you normally would have. And you're going to try to hit the floor running. But it's going to be hard if you did not plan and prepare in advance. It's going to be hard for you to focus. You're going to be surprised at how tired you're going to be. If you've ever had a surgery of, of any kind, like, um, like I had my gallbladder taken out several years ago. And I thought, oh, this won't be so bad because, you know, they're doing these little tiny incisions, microscopic now, and I'll be back up in a couple of days, you know, because I'm strong, right? Man, like six days later, I was shocked at how exhausted I was. And this, the procedure only took a couple of hours. We're going to have that kind of a, an emotional and mental recovery cycle when we come through the other side of this. So the more that you can do to be prepared in advance and have it in black and white, do not make the mistake of thinking, oh, I'll just have a mental plan up here. Because when emotions start taking over, what happens is you can't recall things that you normally could and it will drive you nuts. And then you'll end up expending even more time and energy trying to remember what it was that you wanted to have in the plan. Just simply put it in black and white. You've got the time to do it now. You've got the ability to um, gather, do some research, gather some resources, talk to other people, get a good solid plan. A plan does not mean it has to be rigid. It does not mean it, it's set in stone. Be flexible with your plan, but at the same time, have some pieces in place that are foundational that you can work from. You know, I like this um, quote from Mike Prom of Voyager Brewing Company and Voyager Canoe Outfitters. He says, I'm outlining two pandemic recovery plans, one for a doom and gloom worst case scenario and another for a best outcome situation. This will help me be prepared either way. I think that's pretty smart. Um, I learned that years ago from a gentleman who uh, thought he had his business sold. And he um, was so excited and he planned for the sell of this business. But what he didn't plan for was if it fell through. And sure enough, that's what happened to him. And this was a multi, multi million dollar sell. So it was a pretty big deal. So he said, I learned from that though. I learned that from now on, I'm going to uh, make a success plan. I'm going to make a failure plan. And that's a lot of what Mike is saying right here. So what ideas would you have shut down previously that you are open to considering now? I want you to just think a little bit differently. You know, think about when we go to this new normal, it's not going to be business as usual for any of us. We're going to have to make some adaptations. So what are some things that you might consider doing that you wouldn't have previously? You know, are there some old restrictions and policies and standards that maybe don't make sense anymore? you know, or they won't when we make those changes. Are there attitudes and acceptances that you need to change in your organization? Again, now's the time to really visualize that and think about that. Um, you know, some things that you can do virtually, you know, identify some education content, you know, encouragement, innovation, ingenuity, entertainment, anything that's going to help other people. Again, what problem are you trying to solve for people? And ask yourself this, what's laying around that for years I keep telling myself, oh, I'm going to get around to that. I'm going to do that one of these days. Now is the perfect time to do that for your business. 
I know myself, I probably couldn't count the number of conferences um, that I have been to, and I got a plethora of great information, took fantastic notes, and maybe implemented 50% of it. I can tell you, I pulled out some of my old, because I keep that stuff, and so I pulled out some of my old, um, uh, oh, I can't think of what it's called now anyway, but, but my old notes from those conferences, and I've been looking at some of those for some of the ideas of things that I always had good intentions to follow through on, but I hadn't. Now's a great time to execute on those things. Um, what are some interesting and intriguing historical stories about your business or industry? Listen, you can never go wrong with a good story. If you have an interesting story to tell, people are usually interested. So, you know, ask yourself, what are some things about your business that are particularly interesting that you've never shared before? Now's a great time to write up a little story. It doesn't have to be like a, you know, you don't have to write a book about it, but I mean, you could write like two or three paragraphs of something that people might find intriguing or interesting. Because here's the thing. If you are of interest to people now, they'll remember you later. And so that's what you want to do is, is find those ways to keep yourself in front of people in those interesting ways. Um, you know, again, create how to, you know, trainings and demonstrations and things like that. But think about doing things uniquely, you know, not the same old thing that everybody else is doing. Um, even some of the stuff that you might think is silly, it's amazing, you know, how many times they'll connect to someone else. In the, the book publishing world, we talk about felt need. Felt need is making an emotional connection with a reader, okay? In small business, ask yourself, what is the felt need that your customer base has? You know, what are they hungry for? What do they need? And, and find some ways that you can speak into that. And if you, you know, learn something yourself, I mean, share something that's inspirational or educational or motivational. Um, if you've listened listen to a good podcast or uh, read a good book or a good article or watch an informative show, I mean, share that information. But let me be clear, I'm not talking about sharing COVID information because let me tell you, everybody and their brother is sharing COVID information. Share something different if you can. Or if you do feel uh, a need to say something about it, try to say something different about it. You know, not just what everybody else is sharing. You know, what are some unique survivalist ideas, tips, and skills? I mean, boy, is that grown exponentially. I mean, everybody and their brother is interested in that. I mean, listen, we all ran out of toilet paper. Have you got a great idea of you know, how to come up with your own toilet paper? I mean, come up with something. Um, money savers. You know, we're going to be in a financial recovery phase for a long time. And so anything that you can do to help your customers or your clients come up with ways to save or make more money, um, it's going to be something that they're going to remember and they're going to appreciate. You know, offer laughter and entertainment. You know, people do need to have their spirits lightened and lifted sometimes. And if you can do some of that, if that fits the model of your business, then that's amazing. And you know, are there some things that you can do to help them, you know, with their recovery planning and their preparedness? You know, consider that. You know, you may not think that your business fits that, but, but really talk that through with a group of people that knows your business. Do that brainstorming thing. Don't let any idea be too crazy. You might be shocked at what comes out of that. You know, and, and when you think about the future, I want you to think about the kind of help people are going to need with physical, mental, emotional, spiritual, and social healing needs. Those are all going to be important. You know, on the physical side, people are going to be looking for ways to strengthen their immune systems, okay? Whether they had COVID or they didn't have COVID, that's going to be on the radar of people is keeping their immune system strong. We've already talked about mental and emotional. Spiritual. I, I just um, was reading something a little while ago about 
how there's such a spike in people who are looking for spiritual healing, you know, that is going to do nothing but grow because frankly, that's an area that a lot of people neglect in their lives. But in a time of crisis, they realize the importance of that to give them balance. And social healing. We as a globe, not just a, a nation, but as a planet, are going to require social healing. I mean, we're going to have to figure out, you know, how to overcome a, an acute anxiety and fear of touching people appropriately and being in close proximity of each other. I mean, we don't even know what the, the guidelines are going to be yet. But at the same time, what can you do to help people with the mental aspect of that, with the social healing? Because I can tell you that long before this crisis ever happened, one of the top three things that human beings struggle with is loneliness and isolation. And if you can help address loneliness and isolation in human beings, you've tapped into a tremendous felt need for them. So just think about that. Um, what are the, the hard hit areas going to be, you know, not just from the virus, but the economic, you know, the mental health and the emotional needs, you know, are there ways that you can provide resources and opportunities and, and remember this on a, on our best day, human beings always need things to look forward to. You know, there, it gives us hope. It gives us energy. It gives us encouragement. It gives us purpose. So how can your business give people things to look forward to? You know, how can you help them dream and plan and envision again? You know, how even today, I mean, what are some ways that you can help them, you know, kind of mentally go on a quest for things to do and places to go when this cloud lifts? They're looking for it. They're hungry for it. They need to be able, if they can't go there physically right now, at least to be able to go there virtually, what can you do? You know, maybe you, you know, I think about some of you in the outdoor industry and like, you know, do you have like old still pictures and video clips and things like that, that you could, you know, have edited together and maybe create some kind of really cool virtual experience for people? I mean, there's something about the psychology of color by itself. And if you, if you don't know anything about that, look it up, you know, like the color green it, it causes a calming and soothing influence in the human spirit. You know, the color blue is an energizing color. So look up the psychology of color and look at some of those things that maybe you have in, in your arsenal, your files that could be put together that could help other people in that way. You know, and what are the new world problems that we anticipate? You know, how can you how can your business help solve them? You know, reinstituting workforces. Oh my gosh. I cannot tell you how many notes I have about that already. I mean, we don't have time to get into all of this on this session. I'll do another session specifically on um, workforce, but I will tell you, I anticipate it being a real struggle for people to get back into the routine of going to work because they are going to be dealing with PTSD. They're going to be dealing with um, compassion fatigue. They're going to be dealing with um, anxieties and fears, and they're going to have developed just bad habits, if nothing else. I mean, you know, you don't even have to get the kids ready to go to school these days. So to think that when this lifts, suddenly your employees are going to show up on time every time and be like raring to go and be, you know, highly productive is probably not going to be a reasonable expectation on your part. So how can you help your employees adapt? That needs to be part of your recovery preparedness plan. How do you help them adjust to the new normal? And how much grace are you going to be willing to give them? And and at what point do you have to start putting accountability measures in? Um, those are all areas that you need to be thinking about now because if you don't think about them now, you're going to deal with them later without a plan in place because human beings are not going to um, 
just show up for work, you know, like with their little bells on and be like, oh, I'm here. I'm here to do a good job for you. They'll want to. I want to be clear about that. They'll want to. They will not be capable of doing it 100% as hard as they try. And I really anticipate that's going to be the highest percentage of people. Now, I think that's going to be transitional. I think it will be temporary. I think over time, we will adjust and adapt. But it's that adaptation period that could last for weeks and months that is going to be a struggle for business leaders and owners. So just, you know, be prepared for that as you go in uh, recovery thinking, you know, and ask yourself, what can you do to help keep the enduring spirit of America alive? You know, how can you be a bright light in the dimness? Um, and I don't mean just the current dimness. I mean, there, it's going to be dim for a while as we are in recovery. So what can you do to produce a bright light? And think about, you know, just some of these groups that are hungry for, you know, the encouragement, the ingenuity, the innovation, entertainment. You know, I've got a gal um, who has been privately messaging me for about three and a half weeks now. She is on the front line in New York City. And she has been just over and over saying, thank you so much for, you know, your positive posts. Thank you so much for, um, you know, just the messages, the appreciation that you're showing. You have no idea, you know, how many times I, I go off and I cry a day, but then I know that I can pull up something that you posted and it really lifts my spirits. How can you do that? What can you do for people that gives them something to look forward to? You know, I cannot tell you how humbling it is to know that there's someone on the front line dealing with what she's dealing and, and what I've posted is something she looks forward to. And I would have thought it was nothing to be honest with you, but she does. So, you know, ask yourself how you can, can uh, help them. But, you know, homeschool parents, hey, everybody's a homeschool parent now. I mean, you know, for years, I mean, homeschooling has been a very interesting uh, journey because when they started out, they were this little tiny segment and, and most people made fun of them or, or put them down or whatever. And then it grew a little bit and it was a little bit more accepted and so forth. But now it's like everybody's a homeschool parent. They are desperate, desperate. I know because I'm hearing from them for educational resources. Can your business provide some educational resources? I mean, again, I know you outdoor businesses can. Um, I would imagine that every business leader out there could come up with some kind of business kind of um, educational piece. It doesn't have to be something long. It doesn't have to be complicated, but something that truly would educate a child. You know, maybe you do a video about what it really looks like to be a business owner. You know, I mean, a lot of people think of it'd be really cool to own a business, but they have no idea what it really takes. You know, maybe you do something on what effective leadership looks like. You know, that could be a great educational piece for these homeschool parents. You know, first responders, law enforcement, healthcare community, um, pharmacists. I mean, think about what they're dealing with day in and day out. It, is there something that, you know, you can offer them that maybe they can't take advantage of it today because of the hours that they're working and, and the demand on them. But maybe there's something you could offer for them later, something that gives them the anticipation of something to look forward to down the line. I just think that would be so cool if they had something that, that they knew that they could do that would kind of help them regenerate their, their energy. You know, and grocers and bankers, you know, People don't realize bankers right now, you know, I, I'm a board of director for a bank. I can tell you these guys, I mean, bankers hours, that's a joke. I mean, these guys are working nine, 10 o'clock at night, back in there at 630 in the morning, trying to keep up with the demand for these SBA loans. Um, they're doing a tremendous job. They're whipped. They're tired. What can you do for your local bankers? You know, ask yourself that. Um, and government officials, you know, we as a, a nation in the U.S., you know, we're so prone to just like um, attack our government officials, but we don't stop and think about like they're human beings. And most of them, I really do think are doing the best that they can, the best that they know how. And I have to ask myself, 
could I really do it any better than them? You know, what kind of encouragement could you do, you know, for them? What could you offer them um, to help them recoup? Because, you know, they're going to be beaten down and, and dragged through the mud by the time this thing is over. So, you know, just ask yourself about those groups. What is it that you have to offer? One of the um, things that I do, I, I actually um, do regular leadership training. And this is one of the things that I've created. And it's a leadership affirmation, effective leadership affirmation. Um, but this is something that I encourage uh, the, the group that I train to read on a daily basis, to remind themselves of the leader they want to be. And it says, I'm an effective leader choosing to serve, sacrifice, and support those I'm responsible for. My choices and decisions strengthen my leadership foundation built on honesty, integrity, and concern for my team members. I focus on providing clear and consistent expectations to all I interact with. I communicate clearly and consistently, taking responsibility if there's a breakdown. I do my part to create clear and consistent processes, considering all who may be impacted by any changes. I participate in and support clear and consistent trainings as needed and encourage my team members to do the same. I provide clear and consistent customer care on a daily basis, understanding their needs come first. I ensure clear and consistent accountability is followed through on, strengthening my team, our organization, and the community we serve. I lead better by listening twice as much as I speak. I understand that it is more important to defer and give credit rather than standing up to say I'm in charge and I did it. And I will conduct myself as an effective leader in my personal and professional life at all times. Again, it may seem really simple minded, but it's so easy to lose sight of who we want to be. But by making it a practice of, again, intentionality, you know, reading and reviewing a daily affirmation, it can make all the difference in how you carry yourself throughout the day and how you carry yourself in the days forward as we go through this recovery. Um, one of my favorite little stories that I use in my leadership is this. Um, but first, I love this quote from Aristotle. Oops, and I just went the wrong way. Let me go back. But Aristotle says, we are what we repeatedly do. Excellence, therefore, is not an act, but a habit. And in this little story, oh, I just did it again. Sorry, guys. Me and my technology are fighting. It says there was an important job that had to be done, and everybody was asked to do it. Everybody was sure somebody would do it. Anybody could have done it, but nobody did it. Somebody got angry about that because it was everybody's job. Everybody thought anybody could do it, but nobody realized that everybody wouldn't do it. And I'm going to have to go here. It ended up that everybody <clears throat> blamed somebody when nobody did what anybody could have done. The moral of the story is be the somebody who will do what anybody could do, but nobody does because everybody assumes someone else should do it. And I think that that is really relevant for where we're at as small business leaders. There's going to be a lot of blame that's going to be passed around as we go through recovery. There's going to be a lot of rehashing of things and, and negativity, finger pointing. But while that's going on, it's going to be impossible for people to really be active in making a difference. See, your, your brain cannot think two polar opposite thoughts simultaneously. So if you're focused on the negativity and the blaming and all of that, you cannot be focused on the positivity and the solutions. And conversely, if you're focused on solutions, you can't be focused on the blaming and the negativity. I really would love to see small business owners and leaders just step up and prove themselves to be what they are, 
what caused them to go into small business to begin with? I mean, you guys are really, you have the opportunity to be heroes in this story as we go forward. You have the chance to make a difference and to come up with innovations that no one else is thinking of. You have the opportunity to touch lives in, in ways that a lot of other people aren't. You know, the, the big businesses don't have the um, ability to know their customers like you do. But even today, in the kind of climate that we're in right now, you can be spending that time to let your customers know that you're there. Let them know you haven't went anywhere, that you do care, and reach out in personal ways. You know, think about your customer base. You know, if you've got access to your files with your customer information, make it a point now to, you know, make contact with them. Don't wait until we're in recovery phase. Just check in and say, how are you doing? Or I was thinking about you today. Do you know how powerful that is just to tell someone I was thinking about you today? It's crazy. I've got one friend who um, is a speaker. And I can tell you that as speakers right now, most of us, we aren't getting speaking engagements because there are no events to go to, right? But her speaking business is exploding for 2021 because she's proactive right now. Event planners are sitting at home. They don't have anything else to do. So she's making contact with them now to start planning for 2021. You can do the same thing for your business. Reach out to your customers. Let them know that you haven't forgotten them. Know, let them know that what they're going through does matter to you. And, you know, if there's anything that um, you know about them on a personal basis, bring that up. If there's not, ask them questions to find out. But make sure that your communication is not about you trying to sell at them right now. It really is just about care. Because here's what I have always found. If you are genuine and you are authentic about caring for other people, the business will take care of itself. I don't have to worry about business clients because my clients know that I really do care about them. It's not just empty words. And I'm not just trying to sell stuff at them. Like you're not going to find at the end of this session that I'm going to be like, oh, and hey, you can sign up for this, this, and this. And, you know, for only this discounted price. I'm not doing that. I'm doing this because I care about you. And I care about all the people who will watch this after you. Because if we don't have small businesses, as the, st the statistics that I showed you earlier prove, we don't have an economy. And that's not just for America, that's for every nation around the world. We need small business. We need the heart and the soul of what you bring to the table. So recovery is just ahead. And my question is, are you ready? Because I think that if we don't get ready now, we're going to get blindsided later and it is going to be rough on all of us. So with that, um, just does anybody have any questions or uh, any comments that you'd like to share in the chat? Or anything that you would like to say? Uh, I want to say thanks. Thank you. Um, this is inside, but we're not getting out, and it's, it's great to have some interaction. Awesome. And, uh, lots of great food for thought. It's great to see everyone. Yes, that too. <laughs> it is. Well, I am planning on having another session next Monday, same time. So if you guys uh, can come back, I'll send out invites for that. Right. Um, but I just, I encourage you guys, really... Um, be all that you can be right now. I mean, you, I really do believe that small businesses are positioned for such a time as this. I know it's scary. I know it's hard, but I also know that you can rise like phoenixes out of the ashes of this. And I believe in you. So I just want to encourage you guys to keep on keeping on. Well, and you gave us some great ideas. Thank you. You are very welcome. 
All right. Well, hopefully I'll see some of you guys at the next session. Okay. okay thanks. thanks. All right. Bye-bye. Thanks, Anita. Sure appreciate it. No problem. Thanks.